Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Garm, and I am here on behalf of the Lackawanna County Library System. I am very pleased to welcome you to our first program in the 2007 Library Lecture Series. The series is made possible by funding from the Lackawanna County Office of Education and Culture and by our partnership with the Scranton Cultural Center and the Everhart Museum. We are grateful to the Lackawanna County Commissioners for their support of the lecture series. Here's something you may not know about this evening's speaker. He built a boat, learned how to sail it, and began racing it across the ocean, all in the space of about 18 months. His experiences as a sailor led him to write his first book, which was called Blue Water, Green Skipper. His adventurous streak is not confined to the water. In fact, he flew his own plane here today to be with us. It is perhaps that thrill-seeking nature that propels him to write the kinds of exciting novels that brought us all here to see him tonight. He is the author of more than 30 suspenseful novels, including three very successful series featuring such memorable characters as Senator Will Lee, Stone Barrington, and Holly Barker. Library reviewers call his work breezy and irreverent, fast-paced, and slickly entertaining. His books can regularly be found on the bestseller lists, and he is a permanent fixture on the Lackawanna County Library System's hottest authors list. Please join me in welcoming Edgar Award-winning author, Stuart Woods. Uh, good evening. Um, before I begin, Mary's asked me to tell you that when I finish rattling through this, um, that I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, I'll even take personal questions as long as you don't expect an honest answer. <laughs> <clears throat> and please remember, if you don't have any questions, the program is going to be a lot shorter than we had hoped. So try and think of some. If it gets too bad, I think I have a list of questions somewhere that you would have asked if you'd thought of them. <clears throat> um, I'm glad to see so many of you here. Uh, some years ago, I did a book signing in a, a large bookstore in a mall in Birmingham, and not a single person showed up. Now, I'd had signings where only two or three people showed up, but I'd never had one where nobody at all so showed up. So I waited half an hour or so, and then I signed all the copies they had, and I asked if there was some place I could get a bite to eat. It was in a mall, and they said there was a nice pub a couple of doors down. And I went down to this pub and I opened the door and the walk, I walked in, there were about 12 television sets blaring away and there must have been 500 people in this pub and they were all watching the final episode of Cheers. <laughs> so um, I'm glad there were no popular TV series ending tonight. Um, last summer I was asked to speak at this event and I said I'd be glad to. Um, I thought I might have something to say though I wasn't sure what it was. Then I forgot about the whole thing. Uh, it was last summer after all, and uh, I have fewer brain cells than I used to have. Then a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from someone reminding me of the event, and I was startled since I didn't have a subject. So I fell back on my rusty skills as an advertising copywriter, writer, uh, which I earned in my extreme youth, and I wrote a headline. The headline was, Seven Sound Rules for Writing a Best-Selling Novel. And I thought that might grab the attention of an association or, or a li library group. There have to be dozens of you at least who have a secret desire to write a novel, probably autobiographical. And then in my enthusiasm, I added a subhead, adherence to which guarantees success. <clears throat> I thought that it had a nice Dickensian ring to it. And in advertising, you always guarantee success. Then I forgot about it. Then last weekend, I got another email reminder, and it suddenly occurred to me that while I had a headline I liked, and even a subhead, that I didn't know any rules for writing novels. And I was relieved that I hadn't added to my headline the phrase, or your money back. <laughs> so I spent a long day over the weekend flying myself back from Key West, where I spent the winter. And they gave me a lot of time to think about it. And by the time I landed at Teterboro in New Jersey, 
I realized that my own writing techniques are so improvisational and so ephemeral that I couldn't explain to anybody how I write a novel, let alone how they should do it. But panic is a good motivator, and in the time I had left, bits of creative flotsam began to surface from the sludge of my native sloth. And on the flight over here this afternoon, I was finally able to arrange them into a septet of rules, not all of them mine. So if you're thinking of writing a novel, here they are. Rule one, and this is the most important one, don't ever write a novel. <laughs> this is the simplest and most important of my rules, and if you follow it, you will save yourself from a long series of cruel personal humiliations. <laughs> For example, suppose you actually write a couple of chapters, then when your friends ask you what's new, you won't be able to prevent yourself from saying, well, I'm writing a novel. Ooh, they'll say. Then they'll change the subject. <clears throat> If you persist in talking about it, maybe mentioning a plot point or two, these will come back to haunt you. Much later, when you have not progressed with your writing, someone will say over a martini or two, so how did you handle that part of your novel dealing with your first sexual experience? Now you'll have to make up something and the martinis won't help. <laughs> By this time, you'll have learned why first novels are hardly ever finished, because it's hard. But your friends will never let you forget that you tried and failed. Someone at your memorial service will surely say, I do wish you had finished that novel. It would have told us so much more about him. Humiliation does not necessarily end with the grave. But suppose you actually finish your novel. I'm afraid this is the only thing worse than not finishing it. First of all, you'll have to ask somebody to read it. You'll corner some unsuspecting friend in the library bar. There is a library bar, isn't there? and you'll press your manuscript on him. Do you think you might have time to read this over the weekend and let me know what you think on Monday, you'll say. You'll be too smart not to give him a deadline. When he finally summons up the courage to call you several weeks later, he will say, either weasel out of giving you an opinion or he'll say with an air of surprise, you know, I actually enjoyed it. Why don't you let, it, let me send it to a literary agent I know? If you let him do this, there will be no going back. Now you'll face weeks or months of waiting while the agent gets around to reading the manuscript, or more likely doesn't, and one of three things will happen. One, you'll get a machine-written letter, a rejection letter, back with the untouched manuscript. Two, he'll call you and say, I might be able to place this, but it's going to need a complete rewrite first. Uh, or three, uh, this is the worst. I've sold your novel to Belly Button Press for a very nice advance. What he regards as a, as a very nice advance might be something in the high two figures. <laughs> now you're off to the races, or whatever the opposite of a race is. Your new editor at Belly Button Press, who will be younger than your youngest child, will call and say, we just love your novel and we are so looking forward to publishing it. I'll send you my notes soon. You'll then learn that soon in the publishing business means in a few weeks, maybe. And when the notes arrive, one of three things will be clear. One, she obviously didn't read the book all the way through. Or two, she read it but didn't understand it. Or three, read it, understood it, and wants a complete rewrite. <laughs> also, she wants the protagonist, who is you, to be either a person of the opposite sex or gay, and with a whole set of problems you know nothing about. Then when you have finished the rewrite and your manuscript has been assigned to a copy editor, you discover that you and the copy editor have completely different ideas about what constitutes proper English usage and grammar. But you finally prevail in the editorial process and your novel is about to be published. This will occur about a year later than you think it reasonably should because publishers never seem to think about getting their money back sooner rather than later, especially if your advance is in the high two figures. As my own agent likes to say, if your publishers have paid you in advance and the high two figures, in their minds, the book has already failed. You inquire about the advertising budget, and your editor will say something like, if the book starts to sell, then maybe we'll take out an ad. You may translate this to mean there is no advertising budget. You ask what the first printing will be, and you're told around 15000 but, you say, is that enough books in print to get on the New York Times bestseller list? <laughs> Don't worry, your editor will say, these days we can reprint overnight if the book starts to move. You may translate this to mean no. <clears throat> Before publication, your novel receives its first reviews. 
Publishers Weekly says, a fine first effort. Kirkus, whose reviews are written by librarians, says, this first novel reads as though the protagonist should either have been of the opposite sex or gay. <laughs> then finally, your publication date arrives and you learn what every author knows. On the publication date, absolutely nothing happens unless you give yourself a book party. Each week after that, you open the New York Times Sunday Book Review and check the bestseller list. Each week, you are a little less disappointed. Your novel is not reviewed by the Times. The friends you sent your book to write, book to write back uh, enthusiastic notes praising your powers of observation and your e English usage and grammar. And then a few months down the line, you receive two envelopes from your publisher. One contains three middling reviews from new newspapers in Terre Haute, Sacramento, and San Antonio. The other contains a form letter which reads, sadly the time has come when, due to inadequate warehouse space, we must dispose of the remaining 14,200 <laughs> copies of your book, still in stock. Please let us know how many you wish to purchase. <laughs> but I don't want to paint too dark a picture. There is an alternative universe in which you get paid a million dollar advance. The hardback edition is on the Times list for a year, and the paperback auction brings in another couple of million. You buy a new car, a bigger house, and a lot of gifts for your family. You're proud of your new status as a best-selling author. Then after about a year, your spouse divorces you, <laughs> taking half of your net worth and half your royalties, plus child support, school fees, and health insurance, and probably punitive damages. Because, as he or she puts it, you have become insufferable. The only way to keep your head above water is to write a second novel, and that's really hard. This one will be reviewed in the New York Times by Machiko Kakatani, and you never get over it. All of that comes under one rule. But after all that, let's say you decide to proceed anyway. The following are absolutely hard and fast rules that I have been given by various publishers over the years, usually after a couple of martinis. Rule two. Never give your book a title that a critic can use against it. It's worth pointing out that I have written a novel called Dead in the Water, <laughs> and another called Worst Fears Realized, and I got away with it both times. They did very nicely. Rule three, always be sure that your protagonist is a person whom your readers can identify with and root for. I once wrote a novel called LA Times, which, in which I deliberately had not a single character who was a decent human being. It was set in Hollywood. Uh, it did very nicely, and by the way, it got a very nice review from the LA Times. <laughs> Rule four, avoid sex scenes, since American readers are appalled and embarrassed by any depiction of the sex act except rape. I hardly need to tell you how I've handled that one. I get, I get a fair number of emails from readers who say that I have way too much sex in my books and about an equal number saying that I don't have nearly enough sex in my books, so I figure I've got it about right. The best email on this subject I ever got was from a, a female college professor in Arizona somewhere. She said, with regard to the sexual practice described on page 141 of your novel, Dirt, can you tell me if this was something from your own experience, <laughs> or did you read about it in a book? <laughs> and if so, what was the name of the book? I told it was from my personal experience. <laughs> Rule five, never employ foul language in a book. I get some email from readers complaining about the language and just about as much from readers who say, it's nice to read a book in which so little foul language is used. Go figure. Rule six, never use your own political views in a book. Well, I'm a yellow dog Democrat. That is someone who would vote for a yellow dog before you'd vote for a Republican. <laughs> And I, have, I, let myself have, I let myself have free political reign in the novels. This generates quite a lot of white hot mail from right wing maniacs, which is great fun to read. The mere mention of Bill Clinton in a favorable light is enough to set them off. And I don't think it's cost me any more readers than I've gained. <clears throat> Always remember what Sam Goldwyn once said Nobody ever lost a quarter. This is, I'm sorry, Rule 7. Nobody ever lost a quarter under, underestimating the intelligence of the American public. Well, if you believe that, or if you believe rules two through seven, then Mr. Goldwyn may have been right. Here's the truth. 
Nobody can tell you how to write a best-selling novel, at least not one you'd want to put your name on. You'll just have to figure it out for yourself. With that said, I'll give you a bonus rule, and this is the, the only one that really works, the only one that I take to heart every time I sit down to write. It's called the rule of woof. Uh, to explain, a dog goes into a telegraph office and says, I'd like to send a telegram. And the clerk grabs a pad and pencil and says, what is your message? <clears throat> The dog says, my message is as follows. Woof, 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 woof. The clerk says, that's only nine woofs. You can have one more at no extra charge. And the dog says, but that wouldn't make any sense at all. <laughs> so the rule is, if you want to write something worth reading, you have to use exactly the right number of woofs. OK, I'll take questions. Yes. mind twisters. I never thought of twisting anybody's mind. I just try to keep the reader interested. Um, twisting somebody's mind is hard to do and may have lasting damage. You never know. <laughs> so, I just try to keep everybody interested from chapter to chapter. If anybody wants to ask a question, it'd probably be easier if you came into the aisle. There's well, a I, microphone. I, I can hear you. I can hear that question. If you can speak as loudly as he can, then I can, I can understand you. Yes. Oh, you can't. All right. Well, then, in that case. How old were you when you wrote your first novel? I began writing my first novel. Uh, it, it took, in 1973, it took me eight years to finish it. The reason for that is that writer's block is a terrible thing. Writer's block is the fear that the book is not going to be as good as you've been telling your friends it's going to be. <laughs> and if you never finish it, they never find you out. So that, that took a long time. But it was published when I was 43. It took took eight years to get that done. Then I began writing a novel every other year, and suddenly I had a revelation. I thought, uh, suppose I write a novel every year, I'll be paid twice as much, or at least twice as often. You know? And um, so I started doing that, and then I had a similar revel revelation about writing two novels a year. The problem was that no publisher had the revelation at the same time, and I had a, a very hard time persuading them to write to publish two books a year. They kept saying, you'll wear out your readers. And to this day, I've been writing two books a year for a long time now. The single most common thing they say to me is, you aren't writing fast enough or enough books. So recently, my publisher asked me if I would write three books a year. And I thought, what the heck? So uh, I started working six days a week and five, instead of five, and working every day instead of occasionally. And uh, I wrote a book this winter, and I've started another one, and then I'll do one after that. So. Next year, there'll be three novels out. I, didn't, I don't remember what your question was anymore, but I hope I answered it somewhere along the way. Who else? Yes. I have two questions. Uh -huh. First one is, how do you uh, develop your characters? Because I'm thinking of um, one of, the, one of the, the series that has the man who sails and gets into himself into all different kinds of trouble with mm -hmm. wherever he lands. And the other one is, um, do you know what's going to happen, or do you just start writing? Like, do you have the end of the story, or do you just start writing and it just... Sometimes I've had the end of the story in mind, but more often, um, uh, I, I'll answer your second question first in a minute. More often, I, I'm, I write in a more improvisational way, and as I become older and more experienced and uh, more devil may care, uh, I simply start with a situation or a scene and then I improvise from there and I keep improvising until I'm about 50 chapters into it and then I start looking for a way out of the corner I've painted myself into <clears throat> and I always seem to find a way and uh, that works very well for me. In the beginning I worked um, four hours a day. I couldn't work any longer than that and still remain coherent. I'd start making grammatical errors and spelling errors. I worked two hours in the morning and two in the afternoon, and I would get a chapter of somewhere between five and ten, inch, ten pages done. And um, as I say, with experience, I learned that I could write just as well quickly as I could slowly. So now I do that amount of work in an hour a day, but I'm thinking all the time. <laughs> and the first part, oh, about the characters. How, how do I find my characters? 
Harper Lee once said something that stuck in my mind. She said, if you want to understand somebody, you have to crawl into his skin and walk around. And that's what I try and do with the characters. I try to become them, and I guess all of them are a little bit, a bit of me, even the evil ones, maybe especially the evil ones, who knows? <laughs> but that's how I do it. Who else? Yes. Hi, I was just wondering if maybe you think that, are you Stone Barrington? <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> Stone and I share a love of the lanes and a tailor, I think, but we, we share a few other things too, but I'm not gonna tell you what they are. <laughs> We're different people. I'm not even sure we be, would be friends if we knew each other. Um, a, a lot of people, especially women and occasionally a man, seem to think that I am Stone Barrington and they, they want to meet and I explain that Stone is always out of town. So. <laughs> Uh, my question would be, how much of Holly are you? Um, well, as I say, there's a little of us in, in each of, uh, uh, a little of me in each of the characters. Holly is a little butch. Uh, she's not gay, she likes men. Um, but she's a tough character. She grew up, she was an army brat. She grew up in the army. She, she had a long and fairly successful career in the, in the army before it crashed down around her ears. And uh, so she's a tough broad, and she knows it. In fact, I'll tell you a story um, about how Holly came to be. Um, uh, I used to belong, in fact, I still belong to a yacht club in England where I used to live. I've kept my dues paid because of sentimental reasons. And every quarter or so, I get the quarterly uh, newsletter from the yacht club. And this is a, uh, a sheaf of mimeographed pages stapled together. I think they have the last mimeograph machine in the Western Hemisphere. <clears throat> and um, they, they always have, the last page is called Wants and Offers. And if someone has, his boat is for sale, or his club jewelry, or uh, something like that. And uh, they always list these things. And I was reading this once, and I saw a headline which transfixed me. The headline was, Excellent Working Bitch. <laughs> and I thought, Wow, what a terrific title for a, a novel. It was a, an ad for a Labrador Retriever for sale. <laughs> and I later learned that, that it's a, a dog breeding term, a dog training term. So I wrote half a dozen chapters and sent them off to my publisher with a letter. And I said, if you don't want to publish this novel under this title, then I'll send it to somebody else. Just say so. And so they reluctantly agreed in the contract to publish it under that title. So. Uh, Eventually, I finished the novel, and I sent it off, and it was edited, and a few weeks passed, and um, management changed in the company, and I began getting phone calls uh, from increasingly powerful people, as I kept saying no to them, about changing the title. They kept telling me that some of the sales force were worried that, that the book wouldn't get enough display space in, uh, in bookstores with the word bitch in the title. And at that time, there was a book, I think a novel, called simply Bitch, which had no canine references at all. And that was selling very nicely because of, not, or in, because of the title, not in spite of it. And that didn't seem to uh, register with them. So finally, I found myself in a meeting with the CEO, the new CEO of the uh, house. She'd been there a couple of weeks. And over a period of half an hour, we exchanged views and made no progress at all. And finally, she said, um, well, all right, I, I, apparently she didn't know that the contract actually stated that the book had to be published under that title. Finally, she threw up her hands and said, all right, if we've agreed to it in the contract, then I'll do it. But you mustn't expect the kind of promotion budget and first printing that you're accustomed to. Well, I folded like a fan and um, completely capitulated. And so we, I, I named the book for the town that the, the action took place in, and that was Orchid Beach. And that was the, the first uh, Holly Barker book. And since that time, I've had to come up with a series of orchid titles, but it, it could have been worse. I could have had to come up with a series of bitch titles. You know, so. Two questions, actually. Number one. Sorry? Uh, two questions. Yes. Um, you have developed the character of Dino um, brilliantly and, and, and got into his wife's family, never seemed to pursue it as a topic of a book. Um, well, it has, I'm wondering why. Number two, do you, do you fly a Malibu? Yeah. 
Sure. Well, the, the, the first question is, uh, the family has been deeply involved in some of the books, but there hasn't been a novel about the family as such. That They've been character actors in my little movies instead of leading characters. And Dolce, uh, whom Stone was briefly married to, is now in a rubber room in her father's house. And we can all pray that she never gets out again. Uh, the Malibu, I, I actually fly a Malibu, I, I had a Malibu, but then I changed it for a Malibu that's had, that's had the engine ripped off and replaced with a turbine engine. So it's now a turboprop, a single engine turboprop, and it's faster and smoother and quieter and climbs better. And it got me here in half an hour from New York today. I have a question. Yes? Um, what's harder for you to write, the main characters or the peripheral side people? I never gave that any thought. Um, the, the peripheral characters seem to come along um, almost by accident sometimes. I, I need a character to fill a need in the book and I invent somebody. And I come to like some of these characters. Uh, the new book, Fresh Disasters, uh, has as one of the lead characters a kid named Herbie Fisher, who some of you may remember, who is the bane of Stone's existence. And Herbie is one of those people who, who can make any good set of circumstances go very wrong very quickly and uh, cause a lot of trouble for everybody. And Stone despises him, and yet he finds himself closely embroiled with him in this book, much to his regret. Um, the, the, all the characters except Stone and Dino were peripheral characters to begin with, I guess. And of course, the Stone books, I think, I think this is my 13th Stone book. Uh, the, the first Stone book was my eighth novel, and I wrote five more before I wrote another Stone book. So it wasn't intended to be a, uh, a series. It just worked out that way. And, and now he seems to be my reader's favorite character. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. In one of your own early books, Jeeves, it spans quite a long uh, time frame over generations and decades. Mm -hmm. Was any of that based on fact? Because it seems like you have a hell of a, uh, an imagination to put all those characters and all those plots well, together. Someone once said that a, a writer's childhood is his capital. And if that's true, then I squandered all of it in Chiefs. Um, the first of the three chiefs, who's called Will Henry Lee, was my maternal grandfather. And when I was about eight or nine years old, I was rummaging in a closet in my grandmother's house, and I, I found a cardboard box with some family memorabilia in it. And among those things was a large brass policeman's shield, bigger than they, they are now. And it said Chief of Police Manchester, which was the town where I grew up. And it had been half shot away with buckshot, and even had some dry blood on it. And the only person in the house besides me was my great aunt Ruby, my grandmother's sister. And I showed it to her and she blanched and she told me the story that it belonged to my grandfather who had been a cotton farmer in Meriwether County in the 19 teens and had lost his farm to the boll weevil like thousands of others. And he was lucky to land on his feet because he got a job as the first chief of police in Manchester, which was at that time a very new town. And um, seven or eight years later, he, uh, he got into some circumstances which are described in the book and was killed in the line of duty. And then the second part, the chief was based on someone I knew as a child who was not the chief at first, at least, was a motorcycle cop. And he had been, he'd come back from the war with a chest full of medals and he had learned to like violence and, and killing. And he killed somebody in the jail. And um, the circumstances, again, are are pretty much recounted in the second book. And then the third book is entirely fiction. Uh, I was home visiting <clears throat> my mother and uh, we, we stopped at a street corner and there was a policeman directing traffic and he was black. And this is a small southern town in the mid 60s and there weren't a lot of black policemen in the south and I was very surprised and proud of my hometown and I asked my mother how that happened and she said that he'd been he was a hometown boy. He had a career in the military and had been an MP. And when he came back, there was an opening for the job. It was advertised, and he applied, and they, they hired him. And I thought that was just terrific. And that gave me the basis for the third book of the novel. You're welcome. Will we be hearing more from Ed Eagle in the lovely city of Santa Fe? Well, Ed Eagle was in the last book, uh, Short Straw. 
and uh, I'm working on a third Ed Eagle right now, which is tentatively titled Santa Fe Dead. I've had New York Dead, uh, LA Dead, uh, <laughs> at least one other one, so I, th I thought, oh, and I just finished Beverly Hills Dead, which is a sequel to The Prince of Beverly Hills, uh, which I had not planned to write a sequel to, but I had a lot of interest from readers, so I did. And now I'm working on uh, another Ed Eagle book. Do you ever, um, do, you, do you write all your stories from start to finish, or do you ever have sort of plots that you put down and come back to from time to time? I've never done that. I've always just began on page one and, and written straight through. I only work on one book at a time. I once tried writing a novel in the morning and a memoir in the afternoon, and it just drove me nuts. So I, after about 10 chapters, I abandoned the memoir. Maybe I'll go back to it someday. I was wondering if you, uh are at all involved in the selection for your um, authors who are on tape, uh, the readers who are on tape. It seems as though the voice for Stone and uh, his partner are just perfect match, and I was wondering if you were I'm glad you think that. Um, in theory, I have contractual uh, approval over who they choose. In practice, I don't own a tape recorder, and uh, that makes it difficult. Sometimes they send me CDs and I have to play them in the car. And um, sometimes I've actually chosen one of the three that they've uh, uh, sent me. Sometimes I've suggested actors whose voices I like and who I think are good actors, and they've ne never been able to persuade one of them to do it. Um, but for the most part, uh, it ends up being in the hands of the uh, uh, publisher of the recorded books. Mr. Woods, yes. I hope you'll forgive me if I ask you uh, a question referring to advice for me. I recently sent a manuscript out that was quite large. Uh, I knew that that was a problem being a f my first manuscript. It was 866, pa 866 quite large pages. Um, but I'm a glutton for punishment, and I sent it out anyway like that. And they sent it back to me. And uh, I didn't get it all back because the package was destroyed, so I didn't get a rejection letter. 140 pages of my manuscript were destroyed. Well, I hope you've got it on disk somewhere. Oh, I do. No, I, I did. But I called them to find, you know, I didn't get a rejection letter. I was curious what it would have said. They put me through the editing, editing department, and they told me that I should, you know, shorten it a little. They were a little scared about working with a first-time author with that large, but they edited the whole manuscript. That's Which, interesting. Yes, they it must was. Have liked I, that, there's editing right up what, to the what, what is your question? My question is, I, I split the book into two books, and a person that I gave... That's how I you want, made it shorter? Well, no. <laughs> I, I hoped that I wouldn't have to take any of the characters and so much out of it if, if I did it this way, and I'm going to give them again the opportunity, otherwise I'm going to go to another publisher. But someone who had read the book that supposedly knew a lot about editing told me that the, the antagonist should be introduced right at the beginning with the protagonist. I want to well, know if you, you, editors you are, agree with that. Editors are good at advice like that. When I finished Chiefs, uh, my editors read it, loved it, approved it, and he gave it to another editor in the house named uh, Star Lawrence, who is uh, now a, a novelist himself and who lives about a block from me in New York. And Star called me over the weekend and said, I, I liked your book, I read it, good read, but he said, you need something right up front to get the reader immediately involved and you need this for the paperback publishers because paperback publishers like books that get you instantly involved. So I said, I, you know, I had an idea for a scene, and I told him about it, but it, it didn't fit into the timeline. And he said, that's a good scene. He said, just put it up fr front, forget about the timeline, and then after that scene is over, then start the novel. So the scene was only a couple of pages long, and I did that, and I think it probably really did help. You can read it sometime and see what you think. So editors are very good about things like that. My, my way of dealing with editors is um, I... I think I'm as good about story as any editor I've ever worked with. So I don't take arbitrary advice from editors who say, this is all wrong, you should change it this, this, and this. I listen to it, but if I don't agree with it, I just tell them no. Uh, there's a, a, a clause in, in all my contracts which says the book is mine and nobody can change anything without my 
approval, and you should have uh, such a contract. And my, I think that the fact that anyone at an actual publishing house read an 800-page manuscript all the way through uh, is astonishing, and I think that they must like it quite a lot. So my advice to you is, since it's your, is this your first novel? Well, my advice is, is if it's your first novel, it probably is too long. And you should go back in, into the book and cut it mercilessly down to the real bones and structure of the story. And if that, maybe that'll turn out to be seven or 600 pages or maybe even less. And then send it back to them and say, this is as much as I'm going to cut it. And if they don't like it, then take it somewhere else. But you, you have to retain control of your work. And if they have an idea which strikes you as being something that would really work in, in the book, don't reject it because it wasn't your idea. Use it. You know, they're paid to do things like that. But make sure that the work remains yours. Who else? Yes. I write on a computer. I first I got my first computer at the dawn of the microcomputer age in 1979, and I had written a couple of hundred pages of chiefs on a typewriter, and I went back and put it all on disk. And in fact, I think it became the first novel ever to be transmitted to the typesetting people and set in type on computer disks. It was a laborious process, but the publisher was interested in the idea, so I sent them ten floppy disks, which held 90K each or something, and then they transferred that into IBM tape, and then they set type from it. So it was the first time that it happened. But I've always worked on the computer, and I like that much better because uh, editing is so much better. When I get my editor's notes back, and she says, there's a line on page 70 that, that, that uh, you used the wrong character's name, and then I can just type in a few words in the search and instantly go there and fix it. Otherwise, I'd be flipping through pages and trying to find the line, and it makes the process of uh, ad ad adapting the editor's notes into the manuscript much, much better. I also set it up so that it looks like a typeset page in a book on the screen, and for some reason that makes me feel better. <laughs> Why Elaine's? Why Elaine's? Because it's there. <laughs> Uh, Elaine's, for those of you who don't know, is a, is, well, Elaine's has probably a very good claim to being the most famous restaurant in the world. Probably more people have strolled through her doors at one time or another than anywhere. Uh, she, um, she started this restaurant more than 40 years ago in 1963. And the first week she was open, a, a bunch of writers, four or five of them, came in and were astonished to learn that she would let them charge their dinners. And writers are always starving and they they kept coming back and bringing their friends, and so it got to be a writer's hangout, and then some of the movie people and theatrical people had followed the writers in, and now it has an enormous clientele from all over the world, some of them regulars two or three times a week, like me when I'm there, and others who just come when they're in New York, and uh, it's a little like going to a party in Elaine's living room. It's great fun. And, but as she likes to say, I take reservations. So if you're going to New York, you can call the lanes and book a table. It's 2nd Avenue and 88th Street. How well do your books sell outside the United States? I generally get about 15 translations. Um, I, I don't really know how well they sell. I mean, I, I think that they're modest sellers. Chiefs, however, uh, sold more hardcover copies in Japan and Denmark than, than it sold in the United States in English. I mean, there the, wasn't that many. It was more like 25 or 30,000 copies at the time uh, because it was a first novel. And Chiefs was a very good seller for many years in Japan. I still get a check once in a while for, uh, from a publisher that's enough to take me to Elaine's for an evening anyway, you know, <laughs> which is nice. When they did the miniseries of Chiefs, did you have a lot of input? Um, they didn't want me to write the screenplay. Um, uh, Hollywood and... Uh, regards novelists as a pain in the ass, and they don't want them to adapt their own work because they think that they'll try to cling to it too much when it has to be changed to make it work as a film. But they sent me every copy, of every generation of the script, about three generations, and I made suggestions, and they actually took some of them. And, um, and I was pleased that they did that, and they also let me play a small part in the, uh, in the uh, 
book three of uh, Chiefs as well. So that, that I got to be an actor. I, I had about a, a three minute, minute scene with uh, Billy D. Williams, the black Clark Gable as he's known, the big handsome guy. And Billy D. was having a terrible time getting his lines out without screwing up. And uh, I would speak my lines and he, and he would start and then he would have to start over again. And when we broke for a minute, somebody had to go to the John, he would stand, I was sitting at a desk and he was standing in front of it and he would, we would work on this and, and he had a real hard time. And I thought, you know, this is amazing. The great movie star here can't seem to get through a, a whole page of dialogue without screwing up and you know, I'm letter perfect. Uh, this, stuff, this acting thing can't be so tough. And then I saw the thing on the screen and Billy Dee looked wonderful and I looked like an idiot. <laughs> so I thought, maybe there is something to this acting thing after all. Uh -huh. Anyone else? My favorite of my, my books is Chiefs because it's all caught up in my hometown and family history and it was the most important to me because I'd never done it before and it took longer and uh, it's just closer to my heart than everything else. I mean, I love all the others, God knows, but uh, Chiefs is my favorite. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, good. <laughs> I don't read much fiction. Um, I. I think it would be a terrible thing to, to um, somehow use someone's idea from a novel, even in, inadvertently, and it would be even worse to get caught doing it. So I don't read it all in my own genre anymore, and uh, only an occasional novel. I'm reading a novel right now by a friend, Kurt Anderson, called, uh, God, what is it called? It's just left my mind. He wrote another wonderful book called Turn of the Century, and this one is just out and got a wonderful review in the Times, and it's very good. But mostly I read history and biography. I don't know why, it just it entertains me. I'm particularly fond of the World War II period. Uh, which one of your novels or the series have been turned into movies or other television series? Uh, only... <laughs> I hope that was your fault and not mine. Um, Chiefs, of course, was, and then uh, Grassroots, which was a kind of sequel to Chiefs in which Will Lee, who is the grandson of w William Henry Lee, was the protagonist. Uh, those, those two were made into miniseries. A number of others, six or eight others, have been optioned but never actually made. Uh, I, I think I can announce without fear tonight, though, that uh, every single one of my novels is going to be made into a film immediately after I die. Uh, so my heirs, such as they are, will benefit. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yes. If you weren't published until you were 43, what did you do in your 20s and 30s? I was an advertising writer in, in, the, uh, my, in my 20s and up until my mid-30s, and that's when I left and moved to Ireland to write the novel. And then I discovered sailing and everything went to hell and it took me eight years to finish it. I was sailing all the time. I was doing whatever I could find to keep from finishing the novel, truth be told. Advertising was a, a good background and I always tell kids when I speak to students and they ask you know, what they should do when they, if they want to write, I always tell them that out of college they should get a job that requires them to write a thousand words a day whether they feel like it or not. Uh, advertising, newspapers, magazines, public relations, anything that just makes them glue their backsides to a chair and crank out prose. Because if you learn to do that, then your life as a novelist will be much easier when you finally get around, when you've learned enough and grown enough and matured enough to write that first novel. And uh, that, that ability, I count as one of my most important attributes is the ability to sit down and write a chapter every day whether I feel like it or not. Anyone else? Who? No, I didn't. I didn't. That must have been quite a long time ago. Lots of interesting writers did. Uh, James Patterson worked at J. And James Patterson, I think, was the CEO of J. Walter Thompson, in fact. 
I sense that we're running out of gas. Is there one more question out there somewhere? Yes, um, I have a question. I'm not a novelist yet. I have a story in mind. Um, I, just wrote, I just handed in three small children's books. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering in your experience, if a person's never gone to college before, what are the likelihoods that an editor would even give consideration to a first time? Book I writer. don't think that you should send your editor your, your resume, just your manuscript. Uh, if he or she likes your manuscript, they're not going to care uh, whether you were summa cum laude at Yale. Uh, that might look good in the dust jacket, but uh, I don't think it'll sell any books, certainly not to an editor. Okay. Don't worry about it. And I was also going to ask, what, is it dangerous to send more than one book in at a time? I think one at a time is better. Um, when I, I have to submit my, my next idea for a book to, in order to get a check under the contract, and I, I usually write about six chapters. I write just enough to get the editor hooked, to get the committee hooked, and leave them wanting more. And uh, then we do the deal, and then they send the check, and then I uh, completely disregard uh, the synopsis I wrote at the end of the six chapters. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm amazed that the fellow who had the 800-page book got anywhere with it. I would have sent them 50 pages and that, uh, that made them wanted to read more, but uh, I think you got lucky there. Yes? A self-publisher? Let me put it this way. Would you want to read a book that nobody would publish except the author? <laughs> Well, um, sometimes self-published books can attract the attention of a publisher who will then republish it as if it were their idea in the first place. And they are nearly always uh, how-to books, uh, income tax, gardening, sex, uh, child rearing, uh, th th that sort of thing, um, because that's w what's easier to sell. I don't think that, uh, I don't know of any case where a self-published novel uh, ever made a success. Um, I do have a question for you. Uh, in, I am a writer, and in my genre, the good guys always win, bad guys always lose big. Um, and I've been surprised at many of your novels where the bad guy wound up on the beach in St. Bart's enjoying himself. <laughs> um, do, do you take a lot of heat for that? Um, I've had a, a number of sharply written letters from readers who felt unsatisfied with the book because the... Uh, the character didn't get a bullet in his head at the end of the book, uh, or, or get carried off to jail, you know, or hanged or something. But uh, I rather liked that because I've now brought him back for two more books. Uh, one of which will, be, uh, one of which has already come out, uh, *Iron Orchid*, and then another one will be out this fall called *Shoot Him If He Runs*. Uh, that that line came from uh, an old blues by J.C. Johnson called *Black Mountain Blues*. The line is, going to Black Mountain, take my razor and my gun. I'm going to cut him if he stands still and shoot him if he runs. I'm sorry, did I answer your question? I... <laughs> <clears throat> oh, yes, about, I don't think there's anything wrong, especially if you want to use a character again. There are characters that I killed off that I regretted killing off later because I could have used them, you know? Uh, there was a... In, um, which was it, the palindrome, there was a, a lawyer named Al Schaefer that I really enjoyed writing. And, um, and I let the, the villain kill him off toward the end. I've always regretted that. For, for new readers of your books, which book would you suggest that they start with? And would it be a good idea to start with your newest book or no? Well, it can't hurt. Um, <laughs> I, I just want them to start, you know. I, I suppose that there would be something to be said for starting at the beginning and reading your way through the whole lot, but that might seem like a daunting proce process. Uh, maybe a new reader could read the first Stone Barrington book, which was, um, oh God, what was it called? Oh, yes, New York Dead. Uh, I have a whole series of dead books, uh, and that might get you into Stone Barrington. I, I'm appalled sometimes to get emails from readers who say, I've read all of your books, every single Stone Barrington, and, uh, and I point out to them that there's a page on the website that has 20 odd other books, um, 
and they might give a thought to those as well. But I, I don't think it would uh, decrease anyone's enjoyment if they read the new one uh, first and the first one last. I was curious about the, uh, I love your settings the, the, with New York and Orchid Beach, and I was just wondering how much liberty is like Elaine's exists and uh, like- Sorry, how much liberty what? How much liberty you take, you, you take with the locations, like- You mean with the accuracy of the location? Yeah. Well, I've, I've always written except once about places that I've been or know something about. Uh, the exception was uh, I wrote a book set in Idaho, and uh, it's called Heat. And I, I never got to Idaho. I meant to go to Idaho, but I just <laughs> never quite got there. So I made it all up. And you know, I've never had a single email or comment from a reader <laughs> saying that I got anything wrong about Idaho. So I can only imagine that it exists exactly as I wrote about it. So, <laughs> go figure. Anyone else? Um, I absolutely love Stone Barrington, so well, we're not you. planning on, on taking him out of the stories very soon, are we? <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I, I think uh, one of these days, if when I'm very old and sick, I'll write a book called Stone Dead. <clears throat> <laughs> and that will be the end of it. Uh, I, I just hope I can think and move my fingers long enough to get that one done before the curtain falls. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, no, I have no plans, uh, but I don't make those decisions. Uh, I, I think that movie producers don't read. They read what's called coverage, which is a one-page summary by an anonymous person uh, giving the outline of the plot and saying whether they think it would make a commercial picture or not. And I think that's a really bad way to, to judge whether books are going to be made into films, but I think that's probably why some of mine haven't, more of mine haven't been made, is that the producers don't actually read them. I've always thought so. Certainly I can't disagree. If you have an uncle who's a Hollywood producer, see if you can get him to read one all the way through. Anyone else? One more question. Not even one. All right. Wait, all right. We have one more down here, yes. No, no, this is the young lady behind you I was pointing at, yes. Do you do most of your writing when you're in Florida? No, I, I write wherever I am. I can write anywhere as long as I have an hour of solitude and a computer. And um, it does, I've written on boats, trains, airplanes, and wherever I lived or was visiting. Uh, I plan to write some chapters while I'm on this book tour this time because if I'm going to write three books a year, I'm going to have to do that. Thank you very much for Thank your kind you. attention. Oh, I, I, there's going to be a, there's, books are going to be signed somewhere else. Mary will tell you about that. Thank you all for coming, and I have some exciting news. Um, tomorrow is the publication date for Fresh Disasters, the new Stone Barrington novel. And because you're here tonight and because we have special permission, you can buy it tonight. Borders has books for sale in the ballroom. We also have refreshments, and we will be out there autographing very soon. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>